Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Andrew Jones, and I am the pastor of youth, children, and families here at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay. It is my pleasure to, you, to welcome you this morning during this 4th of July weekend, where we only have one service here at 10 a.m. It is also our communion Sunday, so if you are with us here in house, uh, we hope you got a little communion kit. If not, you can raise your hand and our ushers will bring that to you at this time. But if you are worshiping from home, we encourage you to, to get a little cracker and a, maybe a little glass of juice to join us later on when we celebrate communion together. Well, at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay, we exist to assist people to become deeply committed followers of Jesus Christ who love God, care for each other, and serve in the world. And part of the way we do that is to pray for you. And today our prayer request will come through a different text number because we like to change it up a little bit. And that number is going to be 314-691-7378. And that's my number. So if you just wanted to say hi, that's fine too. All right. We are so thankful you came to worship with us. At this time, would you stand for our call to worship? We come together this morning appreciating our freedom to worship God. May God continue to bless his church. We draw near to God who rules over all nations. May God continue to bless our country and all the countries in the world. We seek to live in harmony and peace together with all peoples on the earth. May God continue to establish peace on earth and help us understand that it begins in our hearts. Come, let us worship the Lord. And now it is time for our summer tradition of the hymn sing. Before we get to that, I want to very briefly say one thing, and that is many of you heard me get up here uh, many weeks ago and talk about our pledge drive. And one thing we had not quite done from at least sort of the pulpit or the lectern yet was simply thank everyone for making their pledges. And I wanted to do that. As of earlier in this week, 142 giving units had made their pledge and had pledged well over half a million dollars for next year's church budget. And that is a very, very good thing, and we want to thank you. The, there are about 62 folks who traditionally have pledged where we had not gotten pledges in yet. We are still taking them, and if any of you have not yet done so, Please get them in at your convenience or as soon as is practical to you. It makes such a difference for the folks budgeting in the church to know what we have to work with to live within our means. So I want to thank all of you who have participated and to let you know it's still ongoing and in the coming few weeks we will hopefully get some final numbers that will help us know where we stand for next year as we continue to minister and serve in the world. All right, so now it's hymn sing time, I think. I think we shout them out, right? 707. 707. Let's see what that is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. David says two verses. One and two then, right? Okay. <laughs> 707. This is Hymn of Promise.
six nine seven. Okay, let's see what that is. Oh, that must be a coincidence. July third, it's America. How many verses should we do, David? What's that? One in four. One in four. Okay, that works for me. <laughs> Oh, this is my song. Is okay. We'll do verse one on this one. a good one. We've had some great ones so far. I'm sorry? 251. I think that got in slightly earlier. The last one. Let's see. Do we know it? Oh, yeah. Good, good one to end the hymn sing with. Go tell it on the mountain. Okay. So we'll do verse one. Thank you for leading us, Brady. Amen. At this time, let's wave to one another in welcome and fellowship. And don't forget to wave to our, the folks at home there who are up on the camera. We are so excited to be together, gathered together the 4th of July weekend. Well, last week, 
um, I had the privilege to take our youth to youth camp. Uh, a couple weeks ago, you'll remember, um, or the week before, I guess, I had just returned from children's camp. So I, I basically get to go to camp for most of the summer. That's a lot of fun. But what I wanted to share with you is uh, our youth's trip. And, and so what you'll hear is one of the songs that we worship to all week. And you'll also see um, our students that we, that we took and the leaders as well. So enjoy it. Come on, let's sing. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. So on behalf of our youth and, and uh, the volunteers who went, I, we want to thank you for supporting our youth and going on that trip. We had a lot of fun. And um, at this time, I'm going to ask Pat to lead us in our call to prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us join now in a time of silent 
and listening prayer. Patient and loving God, we are approaching a national holiday in which we celebrate freedom and independence. We will hear the mighty strains of marching bands and see the banners unfurled. Our hearts may be moved by the events, yet you have called us to remember that it is you who gives us true independence and hope in your healing and your restoring. Love to all. The oppression of disease, poverty, terrorism pours into our lives and lays claim to our spirit. We feel as though we are again in bondage. Free us, O oh Lord. Open our hearts to receive your healing words of comfort and hope. And now hear the prayers of your people this day. Please lift up a prayer for the Sook family on the death yesterday of Joanne Sook, wife of John, mother of David, and mother-in-law of Carlene. We pray also for Christine and Mike, who are currently have COVID. We are thankful for our youth who returned from Quest Camp last week. We pray for favorable test results on Tuesday. Prayers also for successful hip replacement surgery for, Le for Lynette Mortensen on Tuesday. Prayers for a sister-in-law, Liz, in the hospital with COPD difficulties. These are the prayers of our people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Enable us to be people who offer compassion in the presence of sorrow, hope in the presence of desolation, light in the presence of darkness. Walk with us and strengthen us. Give us spirits of eagerness to serve and witness to your love. As we have brought names of those near and dear to us to this time of worship, asking your healing mercies and blessings, help us to remember that we stand in need of those blessings as well. Help us to receive the blessings and to use the gifts which we have been given to serve you in all that we say, think, and do. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. Amen. At this time, I would call our ushers forward to take our offering and remind us all that our mission of the month, where our loose change and designated gifts go, um, is continues to be our meal programs throughout this month. So let's also accept this musical offering at this time. Speak the name of Jesus over you In your hurting, in your sorrow I will ask my God to move I speak the name cause it's all that I can do In desperation I'll seek heaven And I'll pray this for Circumstances would change. I pray that this fear inside will flee in Jesus' name. I pray for a breakthrough. What happened today? I pray miracles over your life in Jesus.
this fear inside will flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray that the calls over your life in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Oh. Gracious God, as we bring our offerings to you, we give back to you from the abundant blessings you have given us. May our gifts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God. Blessings and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power and strength be unto you, our God, forever and ever. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Oh. 
Hey friends, I am so happy to be with you all today. In fact, I'm excited about who we are and where we are going. For those of you who, who don't know me, uh, I came here about a year ago, a year and a half ago, after Pastor Matt contacted me to come help lead youth, children's, and family ministries. And the only thing that has been consistent during this time is probably change. We were loaded, uh, we were loading our moving truck to come here on January 6th, 2021. Yes, that January 6th. The date that became a focal point for the political division in our country. And as tomorrow we celebrate our nation's independence, we are also further divided by questions over gun violence and abortion. We are a nation in transition. I also moved my family here in the midst of a pandemic, a global pandemic. Just in a week and a half prior to my coming, you all celebrated a completely virtual Christmas Eve service. Over the course of my first year here, I saw the church open and close and then open again. In the midst of this health crisis we've been experiencing, as COVID devastated many nations and threatened the Winter Olympics, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has further divided the world around human rights. We are a world in transition. And as we learned during the last few weeks, Pastor Matt applied for a sabbatical and left our church last week. We're thankful that Don Francis is going to be leading us and will be preaching next week, but with the title of interim pastor, we also know that we are a church in transition with more transition to come. There's so much difficult news and uncertainty around us that sometimes we've become numb. I know people who say, I don't even watch the news anymore. We've come to the point where we've forgotten how to be appalled. Nothing shocks us. The news of war, political upheaval, COVID spikes, and the accompanying cancellations have no effect on us. We've forgotten how to feel. Sometimes we've forgotten who we are. Given all this transition and uncertainty, you might wonder why I am hopeful and optimistic about the days to come. But see, I've just returned from two weeks at camp. And at camp, we are disconnected from cell phones, news, and Facebook. At camp, there are no buzzes, dings, or notifications. In fact, when I did get to my phone, I had missed so many emails and texts in the span of maybe six to ten hours that when I did get them, most people had figured out what to do without my help. I need to ignore those things more often. I was lulled to sleep by insects chirping, and I didn't wake up to an alarm clock, but rather sunlight peeking into a cabin and the sounds of birds. 
and sometimes nine-year-olds. Princeton theology professor Kenda Creasy Dean calls this process where we re-engage because we've disengaged with, with all of the, the distractions. She calls it dehabituation. See, without the constant barrage of information and messages, space begins to open up in the mind and the soul. In the Bible, this concept is known as wilderness. It's that space of isolation that precedes every major movement of God. Before the miraculous exodus of God's people from Egypt, there was a long period of slavery. The rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem only came after God's people were occupied by the Babylonians. Years of silence are broken with a baby born in Bethlehem. The resurrection of Jesus, the pivotal event of our faith, came after his arrest, persecution, crucifixion, and burial. But wilderness, wilderness can be a time of inspiration. In that space where the faint smell of pine mixes with sunscreen and bug spray, God shows up. The urgency of emails, text messages, tasks, and responding disappear. The world can pause for a while. And in that space, I'm reminded that God, who majestically created and ordered the creation around us, is still in the business of hope and grace of love and love. I also remember that the God who made all of these wonderful things made me. God made us. God has plans for us to take our hope and grace and love and share it with others. God asks us to be still and know. The two go hand in hand. When we're still, we can refocus and reprioritize. We can remember who we are. I hope that you all will find some space in the coming days to do that, to be still. Because we are people of hope in the midst of wandering and uncertainty and change and transition. During our youth camp, you probably saw uh, the, the verse that was up there. Our theme for the week was John 1, 5. And it says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overtake it. See, we the church are called to be that light. Look at Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. People do not light a lamp and put it under a bushel. Rather, they put it on a lampstand and it gives light to all on the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. The you in this verse is plural. We are called to be hope in this community. Now, I said it earlier, so hopefully you're not cheating, but how many of you know our mission statement? I'm going to post it up here, I think, perhaps. Maybe. Oh, here we go. We exist to assist people to become deeply committed followers of Jesus Christ who love God, care for each other, and serve in the world. This mission statement belongs to all of us. It's who we are. This reminds me of the time when Jesus fed the 5,000. Perhaps you remember that story from a vacation Bible school, or maybe uh, according to Mr. Neal, I call him Mr. Neal with the kids. You know Neal, our worship, our worship leader. He told me about a virtual church musical that, was, that happened in tw the summer of 2020 called Table for 5,000, and church members of all ages participated by videotaping their scenes. It's all about feeding people 
right? This story, which is what we do when we make disciples. This story comes from the book of John, John chapter 6. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. Notice that Philip's answer is focused on the problem, on what is not there. Now, Philip put on his accountant's visor, and he's thinking maybe this would need to be a catered event. I mean, who else is going to come up with the food for all these folks, right? Olive Garden, maybe. So he's concerned about the budget. He's concerned about what those folks, the 12, could, could personally do. But Jesus doesn't ask Philip how he will feed them. Jesus instead asks, how will we, we feed them? And then along comes Andrew. Now, I, I'm partial to Andrew. Um, Andrew found a boy with some food. He included the crowd. He included the congregation in the mission. Chapter 8 picks up the story. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? In a moment of inspiration, Jesus does the impossible by making the small lunch more than enough to feed the thousands. This would remind Philip that God still works and moves and does amazing things to multiply the gifts that we have. When we go back to our mission of making disciples, we understand that it takes all of us. Now, I don't know about you, but often I find myself being more like Philip than Andrew, which is kind of ironic. My name is Andrew. But back to the wilderness. Yes, the wilderness can be a time of profound inspiration where we see amazing things and we're reminded of who we are, but it can also be a time of preparation. In The Lion King, Simba leaves home after the death of his father, Mufasa. And during that time away, he sings some songs with a warthog and a, and a meerkat, but he also grows up. He becomes stronger. He eventually becomes more mature. And when the time is right, when he is prepared, Rafiki, a wise monkey, of course, reminds him that he is now king and he needed to face some responsibility. He accepts the mission. And when he does that, the wind blows in a new direction. In their conversation, Simba curiously looks into the sky and says, looks like the winds are changing. And Rafiki, the monkey, says, ah, change is good. In an honest reply, Simba says, yeah, but it's not easy. I want to challenge you for a minute. In the last year and a half, we here have sometimes tried to conduct business as usual. Have we even maybe tried to do the same things we always have done and maybe even kind of coasted a bit when we couldn't do it? Maybe there are, we've been doing the same programs in the same ways because it's familiar and comfortable. Well, here's the challenge and get ready because it's not how God moves in transition. Now that can be scary and unnerving and stressful, but it can also be exhilarating if we surrender, discern, trust, and have a sincere and genuine desire to build the kingdom of Jesus Christ, to love God, to care for others, and serve in the world even if it's not in a way we had done it before. Listen to the words in Isaiah 43, 19. 
I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Do you not take hold of it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I believe that God is using these difficult times to prepare us to be flexible and do new things in ministry. You know, the church used to be cutting edge. A lot of the music and art and social programs that, that were at one time new, that were one time changing the world, came from the church. They came when the church responded to events happening around them. The concept of the hospital, that was us. It came about during the Middle Ages in response to the bubonic plague. It was an intervention of the church. We should be leading in communication and social change and mental health. We need to rethink the uses of our building and how we can offer rest to a weary, weary world looking for answers. I believe that God is using this challenging time of social distance and political strife to create the next spiritual movement. We are being prepared. So the wilderness, it's a time of inspiration. It's a time of preparation, but it's also a time of remembering. Now, over the past two weeks, I've been asked a couple of questions. One is, how can you possibly lead two church camps, the Appalachian Service Project, Vacation Bible School, and also preach? Are you nuts? The other one is, how will you face the next season of ministry with this pastoral transition? And the answer is simple. I can't do it. Not by myself. Not alone. When I say remembering, it's a time of remembering, I don't mean like the sense of recalling the past. And that is very important, right? We need to learn from the past. But when I say remembering, I mean the way that people of God, members of the church, are knit together to form the body of Christ. We are members who are remembered into one body. That we as a community come together and serve in Jesus' name. How can Nell and Pat provide for the congregational care of our church family needs? Only with the help of their faithful team of volunteers. How can we continue to feed the hungry people in our community with our meal programs? With people who are willing to serve and give. How do we serve the children at Keefe Avenue with volunteers ready to go and help? How can we continue to walk the walk of equality and inclusion and love? Not by ourselves, not alone. How can we teach the children and youth that they are beloved children of God? That they have been chosen to bring the light into a world that is covered by darkness? Just so you know, we are looking for folks to volunteer for VBS at the beginning of August. Shameless plug. How do we continue to deepen our relationship with Jesus, the Son of God who gave himself for us? Not alone. I'm going to tell you the truth. The camps that we did the last couple weeks would not happen without parents and volunteers and staff who help plan, supervise, program, and encourage. The truth is, I don't even lead ASP. We have experienced adult leaders who tell me what to do and remind me to turn in my paperwork, and I give thanks for them. Lori Ashbacher is nodding her head. Condescendingly, I might add. The truth is 
that VBS is still a work in progress, but I know it will come together because it always comes together, because it has to come together, because God is good, and so are the people of the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay. We are all God's people. You are God's people. You are the church. And I'm excited for it. So, my name is Andrew. And like Andrew in the feeding of 5,000 story, I am looking for people who have something to give. I want to know what's in your lunchbox. Because I've been eating camp food for two weeks. Not literally. But what are your gifts and graces? Tell us about your time, your talent, and treasure. Jesus wants to use what you have to share with those who need to eat. We need your gifts and your time to achieve our mission together. Because we, every one of us, exist to assist people to become deeply committed followers of Jesus Christ, who love God, care for each other, and serve in the world. You know, whenever Jesus talks about loving God, he talks about loving people. The two can never be separated. 1 John 4, 20 through 21 says, Those who say, I love God, and hate their brother or sister are liars, for they do not know, for they do not love, uh, for those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Church isn't a place where we go or a service we attend, but a people with whom we belong. What I'm about to say next is going to be the antithesis of independence that we will celebrate tomorrow. We need each other. From the very beginning, God made us for community. Remember in Genesis, it's not good for a person to be alone. This is why Jesus came to bring healing and unity. We are created to be interdependent. Yes, we have unique and separate identities, but we are not meant to worship or serve God by ourselves. Maybe you've heard the phrase that we have a personal relationship with Jesus. We actually have what's called a corporate relationship with Jesus. What does that even mean? It sounds like a pretty businessy thing, right? But the word corporate comes from the Latin word corpus, meaning body. We are the body of Christ, remembered, knit together to worship and serve for God's glory. We only emerge out of this wilderness together. And as Jesus began to prepare his friends for their next step, he'd offered them a meal, a different meal, food, for their souls. It's a meal we'll celebrate today. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This meal reminds us, helps us understand that we are uniquely woven together to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Hope and sustenance like bread for all who encounter us in the world. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks and gave it to his disciples and said, drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, before we partake in communion and pray, I can't present this alone. So I'm going to ask Kari to come and lead us in an offering of worship.
Before we take the meal, would you pray with me? So in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering to us. God, by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Let us pray together as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ, shed for you. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. We have some next steps, some things that uh, we want to do together as we go into our next steps as a people of God. Uh, We know that next week in worship, we will have our new interim pastor, which we are excited about worshiping with here on July 10th. His name is Don Francis, and after service, we will have a time, an all-church meeting for us to talk about uh, kind of what our next steps are, and Don will be here to answer those questions. He will also be here on July 9th as well, if you're a Saturday um, evening worshiper. Also, uh, so that, that's, that's kind of what's happening that next weekend. Uh, we want to remind you that um, coming up, we have uh, Dick Jones, who's going to preach the following weekend, I think on July 17th. And he has been a longtime pastor of this congregation. On July 24th, our ASP folks are coming back. I am in that number. I get to go away again. I'm excited. Um, I can't wait to shower somewhere else. Um, But we are excited to welcome those folks back, no matter how they smell. And then we're going to have ice cream and games. It's going to be a great time. So we hope that you all can be there and welcome everyone back together. Now, I want to leave you with this benediction. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery which you have given, in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.